I'm really going to try my best to stick with our one video a month uh, schedule. One video a month a schedule? Whoops. Hi there, it's Jess. It's obviously been a while since I've posted, so I'd stick around to the end of the video to find out more about the future of this channel, but no better way to do a reboot than with an epic two-parter. Today we'll be talking about a magical character who was born with a cosmic destiny. They are naive to their true purpose at the beginning of the show, but in time, they're able to learn about the inner workings of their universe. They gang up with magical women who are in turn guided by the convictions of our hero. Over time, they gain and understand the powers entrusted to them by their predecessors. And over time, they begin to see the corrupt nature surrounding their predecessors and question their morals. And at the end of it all, they come together with their friends as full-fledged teammates bound by trust to confront their big baddie and bring balance to their universe. And you know, there's some gays and stuff. Steven Universe and Shira and the Princesses of Power are essentially the same show, and because I'm a nerd, I think it'd be fascinating to look at how these two things could have the same exact ingredients and come out with vastly different products. Like, that's not how cooking works. You don't put flour, eggs, and sugar into a bowl and come out with a pigeon come out with a cake every time. We'll take a look at the similarities and differences between the two series and who comes out better for it. For the record, we'll only be talking about Steven Universe the series. As Rebecca Sugar's Brown Sugar, Ian Jones Cordy has said, Steven Universe Future is an entirely new series. But I digress. I think the best person to help me out with that is this basic ass bitch, my little brother, Kyle. So I'm not really part of this LGBTQAI plus or minus XYZ. Now I know my ABCs community. <laughs> However, I think an outside perspective is always useful. Yeah, sure. So let's talk about Steven. What? Shira? Fucking hell. Fuck it. Let's talk about Shira Universe Princesses of Not Futures Past. And Knuckles. No. <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> I've done many videos on queer representation, what is trash, and what are quality depictions of the LGBT community. And when it comes to Steven Universe and Shira, my gay cup runneth over. Like, mwah, my thirst is quenched, my skin is hydrated. <laughs> I'm living my best life here. Honestly, I think Steven Universe is like a staple of the LGBT community by now due to its great representation of, you know, LGBT stories. It's come so far that it's kind of hard to believe that it didn't always start out so, well, overt. Mm. Don't get us wrong, the gay was always there, it was just in more subtle ways. But once Garnet was revealed to be two little lesbians, it was like the Big Bang, but with like, you know, Skittles. And with fusions being the physical manifestation of relationships, it allows the show to talk about bigger issues going on in the world right now, like homophobia and the importance of consent. Rebecca Sugar has some cosmic balls to even be trying something like that. Yes, and Shira also has a lot of LGBT characters as well. There's Natasha and Spinnerella. We can see that they're in a relationship all throughout the series. And when season four aired, the creator confirmed that they're actually married. In season two, it's revealed that Bo has two dads who are just embarrassingly sweet. There's also the new character, a non-binary shapeshifter named Double Trouble, who would go more into the chaotic neutral category. There's also Shira and Catcher, who also seem to have a thing mm -hmm. building up. What, you don't, mm. you don't think, you don't think that's gay? Mm. This right here, that's not gay either? Mm. <sighs> this? <sighs> Okay, okay. All I'm saying is that it's like Schrodinger's cat, or well, Schrodinger's gay cat. Until we open the box, we don't particularly know what brand of queer it's actually gonna be. I can guess that she and Catra are gonna be a thing in the future, but until we actually see it, I'm gonna reserve judgment. <sighs> Fine, okay. What's nice about Shear's representation is that it's just part of the world. There's no other commentary that feels like it's being tacked onto it. It's the ideal world we'd love to live in, one where everyone can just love who they love without a second thought, except for the whole magical World War III thing going on. Steven Universe opened doors for the rest of children's animation to be as gay as they want to be. You wouldn't have Bo's dads without Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl. But sometimes it's just nice to have it be a part of the world and not be the main focus of the story. 
So whose representation is better? Well, both. As long as the characters are well-rounded individuals who contribute to the story more than their sexuality, it's good representation. And Shira and Steven Universe both meet that criteria, they just do so in two different ways. And both those ways are valid, so I think both shows should get a point. Alright, so this might sound weird coming from me and on this channel, but great representation does not a good show make. Representation is needed in media for the betterment of society, but when it comes to making a show, it can't be the only thing that holds it up. There are a lot of layers that go into making a work of television. For a hamplo. Deciding on a winner between Shira and Steven Universe in the music department is kind of difficult because their priorities in music making is vastly different. Steven Universe puts a lot into its music, as we all know. Every character has their own instrument and motifs that go along with them. Mm, yeah, like Steven has the chiptune, Garnet has the bass, Pearl has the piano, Amethyst has the kick drum, and so on. How the hell did you remember all that? Big brain. No, put that down. <laughs> put that down. <laughs> oh my god. And it's like, whenever those instruments are played in a scene or a song, you know it's that character's time to shine and develop. Music in Steven Universe even finds its way into characterizing fusion as well. Take Smokey Quartz's theme. Steven's electronic signature tune combined with Amethyst's drum kit characterizes Smokey Quartz's personality. Together they're a giant kid, a giant purple kid, so their music is as fun and as fast as they are. This perfectly reflects fusion. As gems come together, they tend to bring a little of themselves while also making something entirely new. Great job, Smokey. Oh, thank you, thank you, Smokey. Not only that, but Steven Universe takes a Disney-esque approach to its music. Each episode of Steven Universe is only 11 minutes long, which you can totally tell a story in, Though, with the help of songs, it can condense complex topics into one to three minutes of lyrics. The tonality of the song, like its tempo and genre, can fill in the emotional gaps and cover for the show's inherent restrictions. Just look at Do It For Her. The song gets across Connie's internal predicament, Pearl's horrid slave mentality, and Stephen's aversion to violence and people lacking individuality, all of which is condensed into one song. You do it for her and now you say, I'll do it for him. Shear tells most of its story through dialogue and character actions. It still has music, good music at that, but its OST stays in the background as support for the emotion of a scene. It only has a couple musical numbers throughout its four seasons so far, both of which are sea shanties done by Seahawk. Say that seven times fast. Which is what sailors do, so the musical numbers don't seem out of place, unlike Steven Universe, where the characters bounce back and forth between knowing their own musical numbers and not. There is an episode of Shira where they kind of uh, they flex on the Steven Universe and the musical genre as well. Yeah, it's like they're going, hey, yeah. we can do it too, but hey, we don't even need to. We don't need to, because uh, we, we do it in the writing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think in that episode, uh, Seahawk is trying to cheer Bo up, and he does so through like a song about friendship. Last time I was here, it was with the door and Glimmer, and things were great. Not like now. It is true. Things are looking dour. <gasps> this drink is extra sour. <laughs> Could be the rebellion's darkest hour. Nonsense! You know why? Hit it! Cause it's fun to be friends with friends. By the end of that episode, the song is reprised with Mermista getting her own verse, which only works because her character is known to consume the most media and she's well aware of it being a musical number. The funny thing about Shira's musical episode was that the musical numbers didn't develop the characters so much as it reinforced the established feelings. And from the beginning of the episode, Glimmer, Adora, and Mermista were all in this negative headspace. Mermista had just lost her entire kingdom. Glimmer and Adora's relationship was rocky because Glimmer kind of told Adora she was the reason her mom was dead. Yay. And because Bo is the emotional glue of the trio, his conflicts stem from their feud. So everyone was just soups depressed. And through the song, only Mermista changed. And that's more commentary on the ebbs and flow of the relationship between her and Seahawk. On the other hand, Adora and Glimmer haven't patched things up because as our dear best friend Spinell has said, You can't just make everything better by singing some stupid song! <laughs> Like, even while they were nailing the appeal of a musical, Shira kind of kept up with 
its complex writing styles, which they're really good at. Though, if I'm being honest, I can remember the entirety of Obsidian's theme from Steven Universe, but I couldn't tell you whose theme was whose from Shira. I mean, that's not inherently a bad thing. I feel like what I appreciate about Steven Universe's music is that it is like a character in and of itself. And I feel like that's why this is an obvious one. Steven Universe gets the point. Steven Universe takes its time setting up who each character is, their relationships to one another, and who they are based in that particular society. Because it takes so long to build up each character, by proxy, the audience is spending a lot more time with them. And I feel like I know them by the end of that. Like, I become friends with them, and I start to care about them as friends in that way. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you have things like the cat fingers and Frybo at the beginning of Steven Universe. Terrifying. and Not traumatizing at all episodes. Yeah. <laughs> But it's like, it's all dumb and it's all fun, mm. but it shows the humble side of Steven's world. Yeah. Lapis being taken out of the mirror wouldn't feel like anything if the start of the episode wasn't nonsense because that was what the show was like up until that point. Making farting noises into a magic mirror was normal in Steven's world. But once he defies mama and takes the gem, you feel the emotional weight of it. Ah! Ah! I'm sorry! Garnet being poofed in the return wouldn't have been as much of a punch in the face if we didn't set up that she was the pinnacle of strength and the rock of the team. It's been, what, six years going on seven since I've met Steven, and there is a pride in me seeing him grow up over that time period. We did it! Here we are in the future! I mean, Shira, it's an amazing show, but when it comes to characterization, it's taking place at the same time as the plot, the world building, and your characters, and it's all just one after the other. It has extremely well-rounded characters, but when it comes to my love for those characters, it's less so. That's how most stories will present their characters to the audience, but because Shira is a Netflix original, we receive all the episodes like all at once. Even on top of that, the work ethic of those who write for this show, to crank out four seasons in less than two years, I, it's respectable, but god, like, I hope you guys come out of the cellar sometime soon. The light! All this to say, though we understand the characters from Shira, we don't necessarily feel like we know them. We just don't have the same connection. After chilling with Steven and the gang for 25 episodes before the story kicked in, I felt like there was enough time to get to know them. Is her talking about me? On the other hand, I only felt like I had two episodes to get to know Adora. Jess, you're always saying there's a magic to linear television because, you know, you're old. <sighs> Thanks. Watching something come out every week is special. It forces you to sit with those characters for a hell of a lot longer than we do now. For better or for worse, Netflix is going to be the future of media consumption. It's just that it can be really overloading at times. I mean, we watched all the episodes of season four for Shira in like a day, and then it was over. And based on how Shira likes to present its characterization, it makes it difficult to actually get attached to any of the characters on a deeper level. It's fair. I feel like the connection and love that grew over time for Steven Universe let me kind of power through the good and the bad. And I feel like that contributes to the longevity of the show. You're more forgiving. You're, you're very invested mm. in these characters and want to see where they end up. While I like Adora, I love Steven. And that's why Steven gets this point. Ding. The basic story structure of Steven Universe and She-Ra, especially in the earlier episodes, is to have the characters go on weird and wacky adventures. As the series go on, those episodes and stories tend to get more complex. In a linear story, episodes have to build off what we've seen previously so that we can get new information. By the end of those episodes, the characters should have either accomplished a goal or failed at a mission. Either way, they should have learned something from those tasks. The difference between the two is that Shira has little time for bullshit, as their characters and storylines are just way too complex. For example, in episode 5 of Shira, Shira and company want to recruit the Sea Princess into their alliance to stop the Horde. In the process, they get the help of a new character, Seahawk. Seahawk is a has been sailor who gloats about his former glory, but is shown up by the princesses and Bo anyway. Mermista, the princess, is super gloomy that she inherited a city whose inhabitants have abandoned her due to the Horde's advances. Also, Catra has been threatened by her surrogate parents. 
to capture Dora, so she's definitely feeling the pressure to succeed. By the end of the episode, Seahawk gets his former glory, and Remissa gets allies to protect her kingdom, and the Shiva gang get another princess to add to their alliance, and Catra gets the sweet embrace of failure for comfort. That's four different stories in one episode, and they all overlap. Well, on the other hand, in episode 5 of Steven Universe, Steven gets some crystals that take over Frybo, and then he has to fight a costume. Steven then learns not to use dangerous gem technology when Pearl had already said not to use dangerous gem technology. That, that's it. Not that Steven Universe can't talk about complex things, its stories just tend to be a lot simpler. When it comes to handling time, exposition, and world building, Shira has the option of using someone like Raz, who experiences time in a non-linear fashion. She ends up referring to Adora as Mara and Mara as Adora, as she interacts with both of them at the same time, despite one being in the past and one being in the present. In an episode, through this narrative device, the viewer and Adora are left with the full truth about Mara and her final mission, which gives Adora the full scope of what it means to be Shira. The episode doesn't feel like an exposition bomb because of a well-written gimmick that frames the past as a story in the present. <laughs> she was brave, my Mara. For you, Mara dearie. In Steven Universe, Steven and Connie sit down at a library and take out a history book to get some math. <laughs> no, it's for history. The problem is that they don't even get a human's first-hand account of the Gem War. They just got some guy discovering the historical land sites Steven and the audience have already seen. We don't need this guy's perspective. And it's just too bad that there isn't anyone Steven could have asked about these events. By the end of the episode, we didn't learn anything new about Steven's world. It was an exposition bomb for exposition we already knew, which kind of makes the whole ordeal a waste. In the first episodes of each series, Adora goes through an existential crisis about her identity as a Horde member, and Steven eats ice cream and eats a fridge. It's as if Steven Universe was given more episodes than it needed in a season. A lot of the important things that happen in these episodes are towards the back half of them, leaving them feeling more full than they actually are, because that's the last thing we see. Yeah, and when it comes to Steven Universe's episodes, a concerning amount of them are, <laughs> and uh, excuse my scientific vernacular, they're filler. A lot of the quote unquote important episodes, like Too Short to Ride, Crack the Whip, and Hit the Diamond, are filled with characters messing around until the plot bursts onto the scene. Too Short to Ride spends 10 minutes mucking about the theme park, which all leads to Amethyst saying that Peridot shouldn't care that she has no powers because she's liked for who she is. Then, at the end, she gets powers anyway, which undercuts the message. Honestly, if somebody were to look at the minute to minute of each episode of Steven Universe, they'd be likely to find that a lot of it is inconsequential. Shira gets to the point. Sure, it will dilly-dally in its dialogue and add some humor to a scene or character interaction, but there's never a point in Shira where the character's actions will diverge from the main plot. Steven Universe has had great moments of writing, but Shira's has always been consistent. All right, it's three to two. Steven Universe keeps a small lead, but it ultimately comes down to the most important part of a story, and that's its characters. Yeah, but we'll look at that in part two. And I promise there will be a part two. I have a tendency to post part ones and really, really wait on those part twos, but this one will be coming out in December. But before I sign off, here I go plug it again. That nigga actually left. I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who's participated in prideberry.com. There is a lot of new content on there that I'm so excited to check out. And if you're looking for new content to check out, I have created a webcomic called Kyoko. I am really excited to you know, share it with you guys. Please follow us on Instagram and Webtoons. You can find links in the description below. And if you're even more inclined to support Priberry, you can support us on Patreon. We only have one tier. It's $1 because I am not trying to rob people. And it covers all of Prideberry, our site, our YouTube channel, and our comics. You will get early access to videos and comics. For YouTube, you'll get behind the scenes of all our video creations. If you want to ask me about video or editing tricks, I'll hold forums for that. And you can help choose topics about future videos. As for our comic, there's lots of behind the scenes on that as well. If you're an artist every month, we'll let you guys design characters and choose one at random that will go in the comic as well. And of course, all of our patrons will get their names at the end of every comic and every video that Pryberry makes. Okay, I'm tired of plugging things. As per usual, we're doing a quick giveaway. 
I'm giving away a mini Steven Universe pop figure along with a $10 Visa gift card. If you'd like to be in the running for that, you could comment below. And on our next video, I'll let you guys know the winner. And that's it for me. So until next time, I am Jess. And I'm Kyle. Nobody cares. We'll see you in part two.